So that's about the evaluation. There's a lot of stuff about the evaluation. As I said, it's a kind of open-ended art form. I try to give you my small pieces of advice from personal experiences and really recommend that you try to go through the thing. You will also learn a lot about you and about your software. And when they're, and when they're done, you recruited them, you screened them, you probably paid them, so do not let them leave yet. Have them sit down, if appropriate, and do a debriefing with them. Ask them, what did you think? Where did you feel more constrained? Where did you find issues? Where did you have any kind of trouble? Explain all that stuff to me. So you may want to do either, you have many things that you can do after the test. Give them a break if it's been a <coughs> long and exhausting session. And you could do like a questionnaire or you could do some structured interviews with some questions about how everything went. Just try to squeeze them out of as much information as you can, given that you already convinced them to sit down with you. Evaluation questionnaire will typically be quantitative. We already went through this on the evaluation. Here it is fine to do liquor type questions. These are those questions of completely disagree or completely agree, rating on one to five. I do have some examples here. This is actually, I didn't change the example from the materials. Did I mention the problem with the scales and, and Latin users? So here's an interesting thought for you. You are going to rate agreement one to five. Should it, uh, if you are doing this in Spain, anywhere on the Mediterranean, anywhere on Latin American, by all means, do not use one to five scales. Be larger. If you go for an odd number, what you're forcing the use, you're, you're giving the user a neutral stance. That's okay. You may or may not want to have a neutral stance. That's fine. But five is too small of a number because the Latin user, that's Spain, Italy, France somewhat, there, is, there are actually studies and there's one characteristic that we have is that we are very hesitant to go for the highest or the lowest amount. When we are dissatisfied, on a scale of one to 10, we tend to do a two rather than a one. And when we are very satisfied on a scale of one to 10, we tend to give a nine, not a 10. We are very hesitant about extreme appreciations. While Anglo-Saxon populations typically are not. I mean, they're fine. If they're very satisfied, they will say 10 rather than, than, than nine. So what happens when your scale is nine to five? If you just eliminate the five, what you have is a four. Four is a high pass. 4 is 7.5 on a 10 scale. So 4 is actually a bad number. So if you're querying a Latin population, go larger than that. Uh, here, for example, the evaluations that you do on the teachers, uh, they are 1 to 5. Uh, they're b poorly done. They should need a lesson or two on how to design ex uh, experiments. Because it's not informative. You're losing informational power because the gap is too large. So you want to compensate by it. So go for nine, go for seven at least, but do not stop at five because we Spaniards will not award fives. We do not want to give our fives. We will do fours even if we are very, very, very happy, but maybe not perfectly happy, we will give a four, not a five. Do provide option. I mean, these were all from the, this is general, uh, uh, or common sense type of information. Do leave optional text fields. There's a lot of things that you can learn from there. Go from the very general to the very specific so that the users do not get looping on one small issue that they just detected. So try to go from open-ended to smaller and always finish with tell me whatever you want on a final very, very open field. If you want qualitative information, not numbers, then you may want to go with the structured interviews. We spoke a lot about structured interviews. Uh, there are many formats. I will not go deeper there. There is much more on the class notes that you have on the PDF file, so none of that to know it. <coughs> and now that your users are gone, uh, everyone has gone home, and you have a lot of video recordings, you have a lot of audio, you have a lot of handwritten notes. What's next? What do you do now? Well. You do need to go through all your data. And uh, this is going to be far more than you had on your initial research. This is more delicate and this is more elaborate and there will be a lot of information. The results of the screenings, the notes from the moderator, from other observers, the recordings, the questionnaires, the, the briefing session. You have a lot of raw data that you want to process. The biggest challenge are these. 
the large videos or large audio sources because there is a fuck ton of hidden information in those. It's very valuable and you have a lot of value on your recordings of the users, even the difference between them making a mistake while they were concentrating or just half distracted. That's important information that is very difficult to capture or detect otherwise, but it's very difficult to extract it from the videos. So what do you typically do? You analyze your recordings. You sit down, you watch the entire thing, pausing all the time, and you take note of any relevant events that you see on the videos. And this is very slow, this is very boring, and this is very time consuming. And you will imagine, I'm watching a video and I'm trying to look at places that are relevant because the user said something interesting or because the user clicked whatever the user should not have clicked. It's boring, but it's mechanic, right? It's not going to give varied results. No, it's not mechanic, it's extremely subjective. You will get, you do the entire video yourself and you do all the annotations of everything you thought was relevant and then you do the same thing and these two guys are going to get different results. They're going to highlight different moments on different timestamps. So you want at least two persons looking at each video separately and annotating the videos separately. And you will see that there is a lot of discrepancy. And when they annotate in parallel, <coughs> you will then want to merge the information. A million ways of doing this. This is a pattern, this is a tool that I use sometimes. It's extremely sophisticated. It's called Microsoft Excel or Google Spreadsheets. And you just have a spreadsheet where you have, don't, don't never mind about the first column, where you have timestamps of where it begins and when it ends. I'm sorry, the screenshot is in Spanish, so I'm going to translate the main portions. So this is starting timestamp, end timestamp, what the user was doing, what was the current task, how the user seemed at the moment, and it's confused, slightly confused, uh, um, feeling nice, surprised, uh, nicely surprised, uh, having fun, all that kind of thing. So what was the user emotion and what's what was going on? This is the human written comment of what was going on at that moment on the, on the video and maybe a quote of something the user was saying right there. I have a question here. Uh, for the emotional state of the user, do we need to have like, a list of values that we have to go from or we can, we can just say whatever we want? You, <coughs> you may or you may not. It's up to you. I typically work with a list of possible states, which is slightly dependent on the project. It's not the same thing to evaluate a game or just a regular uh, application. So it may help to have a control vocabulary for this. And just take a look here. The advantage of doing this with this tool, with this kind of table, is you can have a very first field which is evaluator number. This is actually not the annotations from a specific person. These are the annotations from two different reviewers. Uh, reviewer number one and number zero. Okay, so... Huh? A uh, number two as well. Oh, number two as well. Thank you for that. So what you have here is then you can just sort them by the beginning timestamp and get them all together. And then you start to see some interesting information. Like here, uh, well, this is not exactly the same task, but bear with me. Confused or slightly confused. And there may be room for discussion. Then the team gets together and says, so was he slightly confused or was he like really confused and you look at the video again and you look at the user's face and you hear what the user is saying and you try to figure out where you want to be and I don't have any other overlaps here the thing is you may have you will have stuff that was only marked with one of the, by one of the reviewers you may have stuff that was marked differently by two reviewers with two different opinions <coughs> and you need to work with that ideally after you annotate separately you want to get together and try to reconcile all the results. So was he really surprised or not? Was he confused, or happy or angry or just frustrated? And what's the difference between being angry and frustrated, okay? You will want to discuss about that. Uh, yes? In the previous slide, the, is it in minutes and seconds or hours and minutes? Minutes and seconds. Please, do not do five-hour uh, <laughs> evaluations. So just like 10 to 15 minutes. 
Yeah. If we think aloud, 20 minutes, yes. after 20 minutes, people start to get tired. Okay. We so think aloud. Five minutes, six minutes. Depends on your yeah, show. In your case, yes. But typically, if you, you say... so many views. Yes. I mean, if you're... Yeah, uh, let me actually answer it the other way. A typical evaluation for a small system may be just a few minutes. Uh, if your evaluation is going to take more than 20 minutes, you should be cutting it into pieces for different users. So some, something short. And yeah, because it's very, as I said, it's very tiring for the user. 20 minutes is a kind of a hard limit. <coughs> um, you may also want to include, you may want to analyze all the handwritten notes by the moderators and the observers. It's very useful if someone is there with a notepad taking notes just have a clock somewhere so that they can write their timestamp of their observation. So it's easier then to correlate them with the video annotations and you can even merge them with the video annotations. That's a piece of advice. And you would want to analyze the interviews and the questionnaires. And what do you do when you have like interviews and questionnaires? You create lists of factoids. And, but you already know how to do this from the research phase on the goal-directed design, so I'm not stopping here again, but it's the same process. And when you end, you will have a list of annotated videos with all the annotations. You will have your factoids from your questionnaires and your interviews. You have a lot of information there that is already distilled. So you have the raw data, then you have the distilled information, but you still do not have a specific list of changes. You just have a lot of insight into everything that went wrong. So the last step <coughs> is the report on findings and recommendations, no, the last one, okay? How does this look? Exactly the same as in the heuristic evaluation. You get all your issues together, you create a list of potential changes, and for each change, two numbers, a cost and a, and a severity. And with the costs and the severities, you prioritize the entire list and you give them priorities, and you get a prioritized list of changes.